Institute Nature Conservancy Partnership on Protecting Communities and Forests from Megafires. I want to offer a special thanks to Bob and Soledad Hurst and Melanie and Adam Lewis for their support of this important partnership and initiative. And thanks to the Aspen Institute and the leadership of Greg Gershany, Executive Director of the Aspen Institute's Energy and Environment Program for their partnership with us. We have an outstanding gathering of speakers and a great group joining the event today. As a reminder, this event is being recorded. All of you gathered are acutely aware of the extreme risks to communities, economies, lands, waters, and wildlife presented by the continuing upsurge of extreme fires. Over millions of years, fire has shaped North American landscapes. Almost all of the continent's ecosystems are what we call fire adapted, meaning they need some fire at regular intervals to be healthy and resilient. However, each year we're seeing more extreme wildfires in the United States. Multiple factors contribute to this increase in extreme fires. For example, decades of fire suppression have resulted in fuel buildup and overly dense forests. A changing climate, has contributed to conditions conducive to extreme fire behavior. And of course, greater human wildfire interfaces have increased human fire ignitions. Costs from these fires include lives lost, communities displaced, farms and ranches destroyed, health adversely affected by air pollution, impacts to water quality and supply, and forest and soil carbon released into the atmosphere. These risks and harms are often disproportionately borne by historically underserved communities. These challenges are not confined to the West. Also in the South, we see risks of extreme wildland fires increasing. Without action, these trends will continue to worsen. A paradigm shift is needed to address imminent and longer term needs to enhance forest health, reduce risks to communities and support the role of forests in addressing climate change. We need a composite of interconnected solutions that include substantially increasing investments in all forest and fire management programs. Solutions include applying a holistic approach across agencies and among federal, state, tribal, and local governments, as well as the private sector. Many investments in fire risk reduction and forest resilience will bring co-benefits supporting community economic development, providing critical infrastructure protection, providing healthy watersheds and water supplies, and much, much more. This fire risk reduction and forest resilience work requires significant community engagement, planning and capacity building, and support from cities, counties, states, tribes, federal agencies, the private sector, land and infrastructure managers. Our focus is on how to scale up these efforts for transformational impact. The Nature Conservancy and the Aspen Institute are joining forces to convene leading and diverse voices over the coming year to gather expertise and input from a full range of participants to inform a set of recommendations for a comprehensive approach to improving wildfire resilience and therefore enhancing community safety and forest health. I'm delighted now to introduce Robert Hurst a trustee of the Hearst Foundation, who along with Soledad Hearst and Melanie and Adam Lewis is providing tremendous support for this initiative. Robert Hearst is a managing director of Crestview Partners. He retired as vice chairman of Goldman Sachs in 2004 of June, where he spent 30 years in a variety of leadership positions, including head of the investment banking division from 1990 to 1999. He's director of VF Corporation and chairman of Air Click Inc. and has served on the boards of directors of other public and private companies. He's also been active in the nonprofit sector, including, for example, serving as president of the board of the Whitney Museum of American Art. He's an active member of the Council of Foreign Relations. Bob was also founding CEO of the 9-11 United Services Group the coordinating arm for 13 social service agencies, including the Red Cross, involved in relief activities 
for September 11th. Over to you, Bob. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I just want to say on behalf of uh, Soledad and Mel and Adam, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to just say a few introductory words. And first, it'd be welcome to all of you. Uh, we so uh, much value your involvement and helping to reinforce how critical this effort is toward developing a national blueprint to comprehensively deal with the issues of wildfire resilience. Uh, as the effects of climate change continue to worsen, and we all know about it, each recent wildfire season is intensifying, and our current approach to dealing with wildfires and the damage to communities and wildlife and our water supplies, and on and on, is clearly not adequate. From what we have learned, it is not coordinated enough, it's not bold enough, it's not as state-of-the-art as it can be. It's a serious crisis and it's only going to get worse unless we can bring what in some circles would be called an intervention. So we appreciate all of you uh, bringing your great expertise to this effort and to the Nature Conservancy and the Aspen Institute in creating this partnership. The objective is really clear, is to develop with your help a roadmap or a blueprint of policy recommendations and solutions to improve wildfire resilience and mitigate to the extent possible, the negatives from wildfires. And so with that, I turn it back to Lynn, who's next. Thank you so much, Bob, for those comments and for your support and that of uh, Mel and Soledad and Adam for all of the support of this effort. We have a great program with people incredibly engaged in the fire issue and tremendously knowledge and I'm delighted to introduce our first keynote speaker, the Honorable Kate Brown, Oregon's 38th governor. Governor Brown has spent nearly 30 years in public service, including serving as Oregon's Secretary of State and as Senate Majority Leader in the state legislature. She is the immediate past chair of the Western Governors Association. And in 2009, the Aspen Institute named Governor Brown as one of the 24 rising stars in American politics and awarded her a Rodell Fellowship. Governor Brown is passionate about nature and addressing the climate crisis. She has championed many conservation initiatives, including recent legislation that modernizes and improves Oregon's wildfire preparedness by creating fire adapted communities developing safe and effective responses and increasing the resilience of Oregon's landscapes. We will hear from Governor Brown on a range of topics on wildfire risk reduction. So please join me in wel welcoming Governor Brown. Thank you so much, Lynn, for that very generous in introduction and good afternoon, everyone. I'm just delighted to be here with all of you. And I'm incredibly grateful to the Nature Conservancy and the Aspen Institute for hosting this forum on wildfire resilience. Lynn, as you mentioned, I am a former Rodell Fellow and I really appreciate the way that the Aspen Institute approaches critical issues, working to take the politics out to focus on problem solving. Um, for those of us living in the West, wildfire resilience is truly an issue that literally hits close to home. And I'm so honored to join a panel of such di distinguished guests and including several Oregonians. So I hope that everyone watching has the opportunity to visit Oregon someday. Um, about half of Oregon, um, some 30 million acres is forest land. Our state is very beautiful, diverse and vast. But the harsh reality is that climate change and wildfire resilience are not abstract concepts for us. From wildfires to severe winter ice storms to flooding and this summer's deadly heat dome event, we are certainly feeling the impacts of climate change right now. Uh, to be very, very clear, uh, fire has certainly been a part of our landscape and the natural life cycle of our forests. Um, from time immemorial, Oregon's tribal and indigenous peoples used fire to shape the landscape. Uh, we are also in Oregon and across the West, no strangers to the devastation wildfires can cause. 
In the early 20th century, massive fires tore through our Tillamook forests. In the years that followed, thousands of school children dedicated their time to the replanting efforts and their work has borne fruit today. And yet there has been no period in our living memory with fires as intense and destructive as we see now. From the Chetco Bar fire in 2017, which necessitated the planning for the evacuation of the South Coast, to this year's bootleg fire, which burned over 400,000 acres, which was a fire large enough to create its own weather patterns. No corner of Oregon is immune to wildfire danger. And then we had last year's Labor Day fires. They were some of the most destructive in Oregon's history. The immense devastation of the 2020 wildfire season is difficult to comprehend unless you see it up close and in person. I, I will never forget the red sky over our capital in Salem and the thick smoke that blocked the sun, not just for days, but for weeks. With a perfect storm of strong winds, high temperatures and dry conditions, entire communities were destroyed overnight. We unfortunately lost nine lives, thousands of homes and structures. Many families were displaced and many Oregonians are still struggling to rebuild what they lost over a year ago. And unfortunately, and far too often, with the impacts of climate change, disasters like these impact our communities of color, our low income communities and our rural communities disproportionately. There is an interesting twist about the Labor Day fires in Oregon. They did not incur the large firefighting suppression cost you would typically expect from burning over a million acres. The driving winds last 72 hours and our mission, our primary mission at the time was life safety. There simply wasn't enough time or defensible space to put enough firefighters on the ground or planes in the sky to fight fires burning so intensely and moving so quickly. I think it's been clear in Oregon and most of the West for several years that we are fighting fires of a new age made more intense by the impacts of climate change while using the tools of the last century. That's why in 2019, I created a wildfire council drawing on diverse membership with the goal to modernize both prevention and response efforts. The council's recommendations focused on a comprehensive approach. Number one, create fire adapted communities. Number two, fund safe and effective responses for our firefighters. And number three, invest in creating a resilient landscape. This year, Oregon passed comprehensive legislation based on the council's recommendation, investing over 220 million to modernize and improve our wildfire response and preparedness efforts. We know that for every dollar we spend on fire prevention, that investment is returned 11 fold and saved wildfire costs. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, the 220 million we invested is truly a drop in the bucket when compared to the estimated price tag of prevention efforts, we expect it will run into the billions. I'm certainly proud of the work we have done here in Oregon. We know that fires know no jurisdictional boundaries and we cannot do this work alone. And so I'm also incredibly grateful for the partners we have in the Biden-Harris administration. This partnership is critical as we work collaboratively to prepare for and respond to fire seasons that are longer, hotter, and, and more challenging. One partnership that my fellow governors and I are very excited about is called the Good Neighbor Authority. It invests federal dollars to create more opportunities for fuel reduction treatments on federal lands. It's truly a win-win-win um, that creates jobs and healthy landscapes while mitigating wildfire risk. I'm also incredibly grateful that the Biden-Harris administration is addressing the impacts of drought and climate-related disasters. I hope to see in the future that the federal government treat these disasters as emergencies 
with the same level of attention and urgency as they do hurricanes and flooding. Protecting human life, defending our communities and restoring healthy forests, all while fighting climate change are areas that Western states have shown bipartisan leadership. We can do even more if we continue to work towards collaborative solutions. I look forward to working with the Nature Conservancy and other groups in pioneering new strategies for forest health and resilience as we respond to the existential challenges that threaten not only this generation, but future generations. Thank you so much. And Lynn, back to you. Thank you so much, Governor Brown. And I see in themes in, in your remarks that really are going to recur throughout this, this uh, meeting today, the notion that this is an all hands on deck challenge, that communities must be engaged, states, tribes, the private sector, all of the above. So thank you so much for your leadership, leadership not only in Oregon itself, but across the nation and through the Western Governors Association and so many other venues. I'm, I'm now delighted to introduce our next keynote speaker, Tommy Boudreau. Tommy is a friend. Uh, he is also Deputy Secretary of the Interior Department. Having returned to Interior after serving for nearly seven years at the department during the Obama-Biden administration, including as the first director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Manager, Management, Acting Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management, and Chief of Staff to Secretary Sally Jewell. Deputy Secretary Boudreau has more than a decade of experience in energy development, environmental conservation, tribal consultation, and so much more. And we really look forward to partnering with the Department of the Interior and under Tommy's leadership, advancing uh, these multiple solutions that are so needed to address this existential threat. So Tommy, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Lynn, and uh, thank you, Governor, for uh, your very powerful remarks. Uh, and thank you, especially to the Aspen Institute and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, one of the key themes uh, that you heard come through the governor's remarks, and uh, I'll be emphasizing as well, is that as a nation, uh, as we rally to face climate-driven uh, drought and wildfire, we need to do it together and through partnerships. New uh, and innovative models uh, to work together through these partnerships uh, to address this new normal of catastrophic wildfire uh, across the country, as well as unprecedented heat events. There's no better team than the Aspen Institute and TNC to convene on these issues. Uh, both have a long history of leadership and innovation in partnerships for conservation, resilient landscapes, and community-driven solutions to protect people uh, and forests. A couple key issues that I'd like to highlight from the Interior Department are uh, investments, uh, and investments we look to be making uh, in resilient, uh, climate resilient landscapes, uh, as well as uh, some perspective on uh, partnerships. First though, it isn't lost on anyone joining us today uh, that we've experienced yet another devastating fire season. Uh, and this was highlighted by Governor Brown's moving recollect recollection of just this past year. We spent uh, a total of 99 days at preparedness levels four or five uh, just over this past season, which uh, as a government we've never experienced before. And it's a, uh, it's a record that none of us had hoped to set. This past year, uh, the federal response was coordinated through the National Security Council. Uh, and that is a reflection of the fact that climate and climate impacts, including wildfire, truly are national security issues. Uh, President Biden himself uh, engaged regularly with Western governors uh, th throughout the fire season and visited the National Interagency Fire Center, NIFC, uh, in Idaho this summer. The combined resources for wildfire response across Interior's land management agencies, which include the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, as well as 
um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in combination with the Department of Agriculture, uh, U.S. Forest Service, included 15,000 firefighters, more than 500 helicopters, 91 single engine air tankers, 34 other air tankers, and more than 1,600 fire engines. Nevertheless, we experienced millions of acres of habitat burned, homes destroyed, and lives lost, including brave women and men working to exhaustion throughout the longer, drier, hotter fire season. Fire season itself is becoming something of an obsolete term. Rather, we're experiencing phases of a year-round fire season, suppression periods lasting months, and year-round efforts focused on treatment, remediation, uh, and preparedness. So let's turn to um, the path forward, uh, which starts with investment. Uh, the Biden administration is making a whole government mobilization on climate, and that includes stepping up to address the wildfire threat. One lens through which to view these investments is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IJA. First of all, suppression will always be central to the wildfire effort to protect communities, uh, as well as to develop strategies around uh, forest conservation and protection of resources. The IJA will make historic investments as well in risk reduction and rehabilitation. Specifically on wildfire risk reduction, the IAJA devotes $3.4 billion to programs including a joint science fire program, fuels management, youth and veteran crews, community wildfire defense grants, collaborative forest landscape restoration programs, and resourcing agencies, including the Fish and Wildlife Service, to consult on uh, forest management practices. In terms of ecosystem restoration, uh, the bill would provide $2.1 billion to fund uh, programs like grants to states and tribes for voluntary ecosystem restoration, uh, including through matching funds. Uh, this is the Good Neighbor Authority highlighted by Governor Brown. Uh, which agree uh, has the potential to be a game changer in terms of cooperation uh, across state, federal, uh, and local uh, uh, agencies. Also central to ecosystem restoration is work around invasive species detection and eradication. One of the consequences of climate-driven wildfire is uh, burned areas become increasingly susceptible to uh, invasive species, which uh, becomes another uh, driver and fuel for uh, increased wildfire risk, uh, a vicious cycle. And then finally, burned area rehabilitation, again, to try to um, break the cycle around wildfire. Uh, the second sort of key issue that, again, is a running theme through the governor's remarks, uh, what the federal government is uh, focused on as well as I'm sure what you'll hear from many of the panelists today is partnerships. Uh, one of those uh, umbrella partnerships that I'd like to highlight is uh, the President's America the Beautiful initiative, which is intended to be a collaborative, inclusive vision for conservation that recognizes the value of every community uh, and what it brings to the overall conservation effort. It's designed to work uh, uh, and bring uh, focus and strategic um, uh, thinking around a host of issues, including how we address uh, fire management. The initiative specifically recognizes that restoring forests through collaborative, locally led incentive based practices creates jobs as well as reduces the threat to cat of catastrophic wildfire. The Interior Department will continue to leverage our valuable partnerships with state and local governments, tribes, nonprofits, and the private sector uh, to address and mitigate wildfire risk. We have a lot to discuss and a lot of work to do together to deploy resources in a strategic, science-driven, uh, and partnership-driven way that protects communities and builds resiliency on rapidly changing landscapes. 
We hope to have the resources to do the job, but resources must be deployed. And the only way to do that effectively to meet the challenges we face is through these partnerships without limitation uh, due to jurisdictional boundaries or ownership patterns. This is why we need partnerships across government, agencies, NGOs, uh, and local communities. Uh, Lynn, thank you so much for convening this urgent discussion and congratulations on assembling such a remarkable, a remarkable group of leaders today. And I look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary Boudreau. And uh, we hear some additional themes that I think will recur through the discussions of our panelists. I really appreciate uh, Secretary Boudreau, you're mentioning America the beautiful, uh, because sometimes we compartmentalize things and think fire is fire and conservation is conservation, invasive species is yet again something else. And what you have reminded us is that all of these things come together, resilient and healthy and conserved landscapes, uh, combined with economic opportunities of the sort that Governor Brown mentioned, uh, addressing such matters as invasive species all converge in the fire issue. Uh, so really appreciate those remarks and really appreciate the amount of effort that the Department of the Interior is putting into both uh, thinking about, but also deploying resources to work in partnerships to address these issues. That's another theme that is recurring, that of partnerships. I use the term all hands on deck uh, and it truly is an all hands on deck issue. And that means we need those partnerships. We need that collaboration. We need those tools like the good neighbor policy that both Governor Brown and Deputy Secretary Boudreaux mentioned. So really appreciate uh, your comments and, and engagement. And I'd like now to turn to our first panel. We have a, just a fantastic panel moderated by Amanda Paulson. And our panelists include David Hayes, who is now special assistant to the president for climate policy and a former deputy secretary of the interior. Uh, we have also Hillary France, Washington state commissioner of public lands, John Gentry, chairman of the Klamath tribes and Rita Height, who is executive vice president for external relations and policy with the American Forest Foundation. As noted, our moderator is Amanda Paulson, and she is Special Projects Officer for the Bobolink Foundation. In that role, she helps shape foundation priorities, communications, and funding decisions on a variety of projects, including conservation work in the Amazon, in North American grasslands, and in a wide range of other biodiversity and conservation-focused partnerships. Previously, Amanda spent 20 years as a staff writer for the Christian Science Monitor, writing for national news on, news on a wide variety of topics, including serving as the Midwest Bureau Chief, as an education reporter, and as the Monitor's science and environment reporter. So Amanda, over to you to guide this panel's discussion. Thanks, Lynn. Um, we have a great panel here today representing work at a number of different levels. Um, and we have limited time. So I'm gonna get right into introducing all of our panelists. Um, and after I introduce each of them, I'm gonna give them a few minutes to speak. We'll move on to the next person. And then we should hopefully have time for a few questions uh, after that. So I am going to start with uh, David Hayes, who is Special Assistant to the President for Climate Pro Policy. He's a senior member of the National Climate Advisors, uh, Gina McCarthy's White House team, which is advancing the Biden administration's climate conservation and clean energy priorities. Immediately prior to joining the White House, David was Executive Director of the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at the NYU School of Law. He previously served as Deputy Secretary and Chief Operating Officer at the U.S. Department of the Interior for Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. He was a climate policy advisor for the Biden-Harris transition in 2020 and led the Energy and Environmental Agency review teams for the Obama-Biden transition in 2008. David's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame and Stanford Law School. And David, I'm going to turn it over to you for a few minutes to tell us, I'm assuming more at the federal level, how you see some of these issues. 
Uh, thanks, thanks, Amanda, and thanks, Lynn, for pulling us together. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just talk for a few minutes about how we're structured here in the in the Biden administration to deal with wildfire resilience, uh, because we it's a new structure that the president set up uh, in Executive Order 14,008 on January 27th. He established the National Climate uh, Task Force, which is made up of the cabinet secretaries and the heads of the major uh, EOP offices here in the White House, and set up my office, the uh, Climate Policy Office, uh, led by Jean McCarthy, to work with the cabinet on truly a whole of government effort, uh, never before tried, across all of the climate issues that are facing the country. And, and that means we're dealing with uh, reducing climate pollution, mitigation side of things, increasing resilience to climate impacts, subject of today's discussion, protecting public health, conserving our lands and waters, recognizing the connection to climate there, delivering environmental justice, and spurring good paying jobs and economic growth. So our merry band here is very busy, uh, particularly right now, I, I should say. Um, but on the climate impact side, this has been you know, an extraordinary year, as Tommy mentioned. Uh, I don't think anyone can get past this year without appreciating that climate change is here and affecting us in a huge way. What we have done in this administration is established through our office and through the National Climate Task Force, five new interagency working groups to address climate impacts. One on flood, one on coastal resilience, one on extreme heat, one on drought, and one on wildfire. Let me just say, spend one minute on what we're doing on wildfire resilience. This is a new interagency task force set up, chaired by the secretaries of interior uh, and agriculture, no surprise there. And what we, when we went to these agencies and said, look, you guys work together very closely on the response side through the National Interagency uh, Fire Center in Boise, uh, do, you need, do you need to uh, a, a new working relationship on the resilience side? The issue of thinning forests, of, of, of preparing them, prescribed fire. Both agencies said, well, yes, we do. Because frankly, that's always been at the end of the line for these agencies, in part for budgetary reasons and elsewhere. They have not worked together that closely, and they're excited about doing it. Yes, there's a national wildland fire cohesive strategy, but are the agencies working together to implement it? Not that much. Now they are. They're meeting on a monthly basis. We have regular reports into the task force. It's an exciting time. Final thing I'll mention there, and look forward to Q and A's, is we are about, we think, knock on wood, to get a huge influx of money to help in this space. Uh, we need it, obviously. And there's a recognition that we do. It's going to create an enormous implementation opportunity and challenge. So our new interagency working group is going to be busy. I'll stop there. Thank you, Amanda. Sorry, forgot to unmute myself. Uh, thanks so much, David. I'm um, going to move on to the state level now with Commissioner Hillary Franz, who was elected in 2016. And in her role, protects and manages nearly 6 million acres of public lands in Washington state, from coastal waters and aquatic reserves to working forests and farms to commercial developments and recreation areas. She's also the leader of the state's largest wildfire fighting force. In order to restore wildfire um, resilience in our forests, Commissioner Franz developed a 20-year forest health strategic plan. This plan will make more than 1 million acres of forest healthier and more resilient to wildfires, a scale and pace that is unprecedented. And uh, Commissioner Franz, I assume you're now gonna tell us a little bit more about that plan and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Great, thank you. It's a great honor to be here um, and be joining this great esteemed panel. Um, thank you for having me. When people think of the Pacific Northwest, our natural wonders immediately come to mind. Uh, snowy mountain peaks, rolling grasslands, the Puget Sound. And nothing is more fundamental in Washington State, however, than our forest. We are the evergreen state, after all. Our forests provide the air that sustains us, the shade that cools us, the materials that shelter us, and the jobs that feed us. But these life-sustaining forests we depend on for so much are in trouble. In the rainy, cold, wet state of Washington, we're watching our forests die. 
This year, you can look at a wildfire map of the West and draw a trend line from Washington down to California. These fires are burning in forests filled with sick and dying trees, and we have a limited window to change this course. As Commissioner of Public Lands, I lead Washington State's wildfire fighting force, and every year I see firsthand the devastation these catastrophic fires inflict on our communities and on our environment. The forests turn to ash, the towns destroyed, the toxic smoke that clouds our skies, the lives tragically lost. Even the animals burned, including this year when I visited three black bear cubs who were horribly burned by a fire in central Washington. Every fire season, the devastation further illustrates a harsh reality that we need to manage our forests to restore their natural wildfire resistance, to reduce the fuel load, reduce the disease and infestation, and give our forests a fighting chance. That's why I launched a bold 20-year forest health strategic plan to start restoring the health of our highest risk forests, spanning state, federal, tribal, and private lands in all of Eastern Washington. The plan sets an unprecedented goal of restoring 1.25 million acres over the next 20 years, calling for us to treat approximately 70,000 acres of forest each year using mechanical thinning and prescribed burn and being agnostic to property lines since fire and disease are agnostic to property lines. Prescribed fire is a controlled way to burn away excess vegetation on the forest floor. It requires a lot of expertise and training to pull off, but it's a powerful tool to also protect our communities and bring forests back to health. Likewise, thinning procedures reduce the density of forests and weed out the dead, more flammable trees, slowing the spread of wildfire, but also putting them to use as building product. Now, earlier this year, we passed the most historic investment at the state level in wildfire response and forest restoration. Thanks to a major bipartisan effort, we passed it unanimously. When can you ever say unanimous in politics at any point in time? House Bill 1168 um, will now generate $500 million investment in wildfire response, forest health, and community resilience, something that none of us would have believed possible just a year ago. This funding will accelerate our existing forest health initiatives, hardening our forest against the flames on state, federal, and private and tribal lands. Since 2017, when we passed the plan, we've treated more than 320,000 acres of state and federal lands. We're more than 25% of the way to reaching that 1.25 million acre goal. Given the size, the number, and the geography of wildfires we're seeing, however, we have to go faster in scale. We have to go farther in area if we're going to reduce the threat of these fires and prevent the evergreen state turning charcoal black. So last year after the Labor Day firestorms, after 620,000 acres burned in Washington, over a million acres burned in Oregon, I challenged my own team. We have to go faster. We need to move as fast as wildfire. How do we achieve that 20 year forest health plan in 10 years, not 20? On state lands, we are now double downing. We're increasing our pace and scale of our 20 year plan to achieve it in just 10 years. But we can't do it alone. Of that 2.7 million acres of forest in Eastern Washington alone that are dead and dying, 1.3 million acres of that is federal lands. We have the good neighbor authority. We have the tools. We're doing as much as we possibly can as an agency, but we know no one single organization can accomplish the large scale change we need. As we know, we have all lands, all hands vision that must be implemented. Our cross boundary collaboration includes that historic good neighbor authority agreement with the US Forest Service. This agreement allows DNR, my agency, to carry out the forest health thinnings and other fuel reduction treatments in each of our state's five main national forests. We signed that Good Neighbor Authority in March 2017, and we have been ramping up our work ever since. 1,000 acres from 2017 to 2019, 7,500 acres from 2019 to 2020, and now 16,000 acres over the next two years. But frankly, we have got to go even faster. We're now sitting down with U.S. Forest Service and setting clear targets in each of our key national forests. With the funding coming from the infrastructure bill, 
We want to partner closely so that we together jointly, state and federal agencies, can achieve the goals we need to on behalf of our own mission and mandate and on behalf of helping ensure that we keep the evergreen state evergreen, that we change the tide we're on of these catastrophic fires, and that we give our force the fighting chance to fight them on their own, which they can do. Looking forward to working with each and every one of you to make progress on this historic moment and this heroic goal. Thank you. Thanks, Hillary. I'm gonna move on to Don Gentry, who's been chairman of the Klamath Tribes, headquartered in Chiloquin, Oregon since 2013. And prior to being elected to the Klamath Tribal Council, Don worked for the Klamath Tribes Natural Resource Department for 25 years, where he served as the Klamath Tribes Natural Resource Specialist. Having been taught by his father to be a Klamath tribal hunter and fisherman, he is very knowledgeable about the forests, lakes, marshes, rivers, creeks, and fish and wildlife resources throughout South Central Oregon. Don worked for the U.S. Forest Service on the Fremont Winnemah National Forest in 1973 to 1974 and 1981 to 1983 in fire control. Don, turning over to you. Uh, Waklisa, greetings. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, as a tribal representative, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, our specific uh, uh, situation, but also want to do what I can to support uh, tribes throughout the nation. And I have some thoughts about this. So I thank you for the opportunity. You know, it's important for us to be on the same page. Obviously, this was pointed out. It's a pretty complex issue, you know, addressing climate change and all the impacts of uh, climate change on our forests and water availability, which we're in the throes of, uh, you know, you know, drought and in battles over water and fish, uh, which is even related to forest health, you know, because the forests are so out of whack that not only affect hydrology, but affect uh, uh, the health of the forest and in uh, the current uh, fire conditions and risks that we have. So I thought it would be real helpful to just uh, you know point out that each tribe in the nation is unique, has uh, unique standing. Uh, we're all connected to our, our homelands and use those lands uh, uh, for uh, hunting, fishing, trapping, gathering, uh, cultural, religious practices, but also there's economic opportunity associated with those lands. Uh, in our case, uh, we're the Klamath, Modoc, and Paiute people, uh, three tribes. Uh, collectively referred to as the Klamath Tribes of Oregon. We're at the headwaters of the Klamath River, uh, where the water flows out of the ground from springs and starts the tributaries into Klamath Lake and then eventually into the Klamath River that in, enters into the mouth of uh, uh, the Klamath River at uh, Requa, you know, at the ocean there in Northern California. So we're, it's pretty important to consider uh, the impacts of uh, uh, forest management on uh, you know, water availability, but also the fire risk that is so concerned. We were recently impacted negatively by the 242 fire that burned in, in our homeland, in the area where we live. You know, it's right off Highway 97, north of Chiloquin, where our headquarters are. And then uh, the a bootleg fire that burnt uh, about 25% of our treaty rights area uh, and then burnt out into our traditional homeland and had a negative impact on the whole watershed here and really concerned about nutrient input from erosion coming into our streams. But uh, with that, I just wanted to point out, um, you know, that's really important. Uh, and I really appreciate representative from uh, uh, representatives from uh, this current administration. You know, uh, we uh, often, uh, we have a lot of contact and communication with folks in the Department of Interior, but you know, the trust obligation to meet the tribe's needs, you know, you know, falls within the full federal government, you know, with our treaty tribes. And so it's important, you know, from the highest levels of the administration to really uh, consult and coordinate with affected tribes on forest management uh, that affects fires and forest health and, and hydrology and, and treaty resources that are important to all of us. So I think it's really important to, you know, break out of those silos. And, uh, you know, in our case, uh, a lot of the land is managed by uh, uh, the, uh, the Forest Service, which is in the Department of Agriculture. And, uh, but we also have uh, uh, water rights and treaty rights. There's BLM land under Interior. We also have the state uh, uh, lands and then private lands. So it gets pretty complex, as was pointed out uh, earlier. Uh, about how to effectively uh, address things at the watershed management scale. 
So I, I just wanted to point out, it's important to have good coordination and support uh, from administration all through and, and whenever uh, we need to come together to figure out what's uh, best to do to move forward with managing the forests and, and reduce fire risk is really necessary. That even includes um, building the capacity for the tribes to be involved. You know, we uh, were, we're federally terminated, we were terminated. We ceded 20 million acres of our land to the federal government for the benefit of U.S. citizens and secured the land. And according to, uh, you know, but a, a, the tragic history of the Klamath tribes, we eventually lost our lands and we're exercising rights, uh, uh, court affirmed rights within our 1954 treaty boundary area, the area that we had at the time of termination. And a lot of those lands are um, forest service lands, some state land, mostly private lands. And uh, so that it's really important. Uh, but we've, uh, uh, prior to termination, we had court affirmed uh, treaty rights. And uh, so we were actually receiving for, uh, funds from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to support our management of our treaty rights. But we've asserted our authority and position. We now have a partnership with the Forest Service after years of uh, timber sale appeals and litigation, you know, when folks were business as usual as getting the cut out and it wasn't a, a addressing our concerns. But uh, what I wanted to say that's really important for uh, tribes, I believe this is universal against tribes uh, across the nation here, uh, that uh, we need to build our capacity to be co-managers of lands that uh, affect us. And we need that financial support to, to do that. We have plans on uh, uh, healthy forest management. We have a forest management plan that's state of the art, you know, that applies here in our east side uh, 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 Cascade uh, high desert uh, uh, fringe area, forest area that applies. But we haven't had the capacity to really be fully involved in doing uh, not only uh, addressing impacts from fires, but also being more proactive uh, to uh, develop treatments, you know, that are consistent with our forest plan, which we believe will improve the forest resiliency, risk to fire, and address hydrology and all the other habitat concerns that affect our resources. So uh, it's important for that. And I'm just so encouraged that, you know, with the infrastructure bill, even uh, funding in ARPA, uh, there's state funding available, you know, when we're talking about building fire resilient communities that we can tap into. And we've actually had uh, really great support from non-governmental entities to help us secure funds to do some treatments. And it actually was a lot easier to deal with those folks to, uh, you know, to, you know, try to address impacts of the fire than looking for federal funds. We have folks that have given us funds directly to hire uh, cultural resource folks to do surveys before activities. We're surveying damage, looking at uh, erosion risk and partnering with the Forest Service, uh, Green Diamond, a large timber uh, uh, owner and manager in the area, and uh, uh, also um, the Nature Conservancy. You know, that's part of the reason why we were connected here because of our positive relationship with them and it's been building and developing. So I just wanted to make those uh, things known that we need to be supported. Uh, we need to build our capacity. We need support from uh, the highest levels of administration on down so we can work beyond the silos within the federal government and also work with the state agencies and continued work with uh, uh, the nonprofits, the NGOs, uh, such as uh, Nature Conservancy and other entities that have supported us. And we have such a positive relationship with Nature Conservancy. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak generally. Hopefully it didn't take too much time, but be willing to take questions. Uh, I just thought that'd be the most effective way to start out. It just, you know, with what I shared. So thank you. Thanks, Sun. And finally, um, I'm going to introduce Rita Height, who is currently serving as Executive Vice President of External Relations and Policy at the American Forest Foundation. Uh, in this role, she leads the foundation's positioning, external relationships, and public policy strategy. But on January 1st, Rita will assume the position of President and CEO of the American Forest Foundation. In her 20-year career in forest conservation, Rita staffed congressional leaders on the House Committee on Agriculture, built and curated coalitions and partnerships, including the Forest Climate Working Group, the uh, Women's Forest Congress, and served as a nonprofit uh, leader. Rita, I'll turn this over to you, and then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for discussion at the end. And I'm hearing we may be able to extend this panel by about five extra minutes, too, because I know we're starting to run short on time. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for the introduction, and I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, a little bit about the American Forest Foundation for those of you that aren't familiar with us. 
We're a national conservation organization that delivers meaningful conservation impact, tackling issues like wildfire, climate change, and biodiversity loss by empowering family landowners to take action in their woods. And when it comes to wildfire, empowering family landowners is a critical piece of the puzzle because wildfires know no boundaries. A number of folks have already said that today. Just a couple of statistics to put in your head. So if, if there's roughly around 50 million acres of high fire risk um, acres in, in the West, over a third of those are owned by families and individuals. And the Forest Service estimates that fire risk posed to structures, for example, largely comes from non-federal lands and about 50% of that risk comes from private lands. So we can see that um, just like the federal, the state, and the tribal folks need to be at the table, the private landowners are a critical piece of the puzzle in, in addressing wildfire issues as, as others have named. What's also important to note is family landowners can and want to address wildfire, but they can't do it alone. I think that's a common theme you've heard here today as well. And let me just um, give an example of, of, of Harold Stimson, a family landowner um, in California. He owns 16 acres in a high fire risk area. And he couldn't do his work alone. So what we did is we worked with him to partner with a number of uh, landowners adjacent to him so that they could actually create a viable fuels reduction project and he could get the work done. Harold is one of thousands of family landowners we're working with across the West and that need help. And today we have more than 500,000 acres of family land family lands in the pipeline ready to do fuels treatment. But there's a number of barriers standing in the way. Cost is a key barrier. We've heard, a, we'll hear a lot about that, I think. Uh, knowledge and experience is a really important issue for family landowners and that nine out of 10 family landowners in the West have little to no experience managing their land. Again, they want to do the right thing. They are good stewards, but they need help. Another key barrier is a lack of a landscape strategy and consistent shared priorities. You might think that sounds like a government or a um, you know, an, an issue for, for governments and, and organizations, but it's a very important issue for family landowners because if they take that action on their lands, but their neighbors, either public or private, don't, they know their, vest, their investment likely means little. So they're less likely to take action if there isn't that landscape strategy. So just a couple of things I'll highlight that um, we think are essential to empowering family landowners to take action on, on wildfire. Again, these strategic shared landscape priorities that we can all focus on because none of us can do this alone. Um, our actions alone won't be sufficient. Technical and financial resources for family landowners are key, um, but we need to change the current model. Um, there's work that needs to be done there. We need to leverage the private sector and leverage private sector finance for a sustainable strategy. The public dollars are critical and we're so excited and supportive of what's um, being debated right now in Congress, but we've got to leverage the private sector if we're going to sustain this um, long term. We've got to create accountability systems that allow us to focus on outcomes and that ensures we can measure our progress and learn and adapt together. Again, so we know if we're moving the needle. We need some coordinated capacity planning. Um, that's a key issue in that a lot of times with the family landowners, we struggle to get contractors because family lands are small jobs. Um, and the bigger jobs are ten, tend to be on the public land. So how do we coordinate capacity so that we can get this all land work happening? Um, I know Hillary and a number of other folks talked about wood utilization. I don't think I need to say more. <laughs> That's a critical piece of the equation. Um, and then lastly, something that is really important for us as we think about how we work with family landowners over time, we need a sustaining strategy. We need to find a way to sustain this work, bring fire back into the landscape. Hillary and others have talked about this. So we're not back here again in 15 and 20 years. There's got to be a way for us to continue to sustain the work on the ground with, with family lands and all lands. So thank you um, for the opportunity um, to be with you all. We're pleased to be part of this discussion because it's important that governments, communities, corporations, and all types of landowners, large and small, public and private, tribal, act together on wildfire resilience. So thank you um, for the opportunity. <clears throat> Thanks to all of you. And I know we're running short on time. I hope we have at least a little bit of time to get into some discussion here. Um, you know, all of you have spoken about the need to work together with partners um, and different stakeholders and different levels of government to address this enormous challenge. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about some of the barriers that exist. And Rita, I know you just did mention some of those from your perspective, as well as what you see as the biggest opportunities for overcoming those barriers and leveraging partnerships to improve resilience. Um, and I'm gonna let you guys figure it out. Maybe David, you'd like to start since 
been a little while since we've been able to hear from you. Sure, I'd be happy to make a few comments and apologies, I'm gonna to have to leave at the top of the hour for another White House meeting. Uh, but um, I guess I'm focused right now where I sit on the planning aspects of dealing with uh, resilience. And, um, uh, you know, because I, I think on the ground, folks know how to work together, they've had to learn and it's challenging. Uh, um, uh, although I, I would, welcome others' perspectives on that. But on the planning side, in terms of uh, the comment was rightly made, uh, when it comes to wildfire, boundaries don't mean much. Uh, and there really needs to be close cooperation among private landowners, tribal uh, governments, state landowners, uh, and the federal government. Um, and and that can be hard because the federal government has some special uh, environmental requirements, for example, to do NEPA reviews, et cetera. There are uh, tribal governments certainly have their own special interests uh, that are important and so do private landowners. So everyone's gonna have to get on the same page. And, and I, I expect that this year's uh, horrible situation uh, has reminded everybody just how important it is actually to be planning ahead. And I think there's an opportunity, coming out of crisis comes opportunity to, to uh, get plans together, uh, to hopefully use the new monies that are coming in from both the state level and the federal level and use them wisely uh, to create fire breaks, to do thinning in areas, to protect important properties, uh, to let the fire burn where it should and do that on, under controlled conditions. All that requires a lot of expertise, planning and coordination. So it'll be a challenge, uh, but it's 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 the opportunity too that's right in front of us. Thanks, David. Um, Hillary, Arita, or Don, do you want to address this topic at all in terms of the um, both the barriers to some of this work together, as well as maybe opportunities that you're hoping as you go forward? Yeah, so I'll start, I think, you know, each land sort of owner has its own challenges and barriers. I mean, I think I feel very fortunate to be able to be managing sort of state lands and being able to set a very clear call to action and use my voice and my position to show that we've got to move aggressively forward and that actually it is on the best uh, for the environment and for our communities. Um, we will leverage that. I think some of our challenge when it comes to private landowners is they're very disparate. We have, they all come from different backgrounds. Some are reluctant about the government. Some embrace the government. Some don't know what to do, when to do it. Some don't know about available resources. And so it's one by one by one trying to reach out to 8 million acres owned by private landowners. That's a struggle, but we are building a broad campaign um, and I think we will be very successful in that sort of broad effort. Um, on the federal land side, we all have sort of different processes. And I think um, there's a much larger landscape to be reached um, with very significant public input on multiple different sides that the federal governments have to be really listening to. Um, what I'm hoping for is that by leveraging sort of the profile we have created of the urgency of this and the crisis of it, that it will help build a broader support for all of those landowners coming together and feeling they're working sort of concerted together and will have each other's back as things go wrong or as issues rise. Um, and I am only hope at this point, because I think we've come to that moment that we've been building to of urgency, of crisis, and of education engagement of the public. Um, and I think the last thing we're going to need more than anything before, besides working collaboratively together, is courage, 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 courage. Thank you. I'm wondering, as we wrap up in the last few minutes, David, I know you have to leave. Thank you so much. Um, Don and Rita, you know, this is such a um, overwhelming and daunting and often really depressing topic. Are there any bright spots that you see going forward or anything that gives you hope about our ability to um, manage for wildfire resilience? 
if I could, yeah, I really appreciate you know, just the way that we're looking at this holistically. I think uh, we need to have, uh, and we had some recent success in working with the Forest Service, uh, private land uh, owners, Nature Conservancy, and Green Diamond, which are mostly most significantly affected by the fire, but also pointed out some of the obstacles. I think what we need perhaps is some kind of a, a, a real uh, a proactive effort to bring uh, affected communities together to look at this, whether it's maybe a, a state initiative that could pull the Forest Service, BLM, private landowners together to, to strategize and even have discussions and try to address where, where the obstacles are. And there are some solutions, uh, you know, if we, if we all focus on that. So I'm hoping we could get there. And we had recent success in uh, trying to move forward best we can. And then we're, you know, we're building on that with those uh, entities uh, significantly impacting our area of concern. So uh, there's a bright spot there, but I also wanted to interject to, you know, you know, maybe a solution is a more proactive effort, perhaps by the states, you know, to bring folks collectively together to address these issues. Yeah, and, and I would agree. I think there's a lot of momentum um, happening right now. I think that the other thing I would add, and, and this goes to, to Hillary's point, um, you know, the, the, the pri private lands and family lands are very disparate. Um, you know, there, there's a, a whole host of owners. Every single one of them has different goals and objectives. Um, but again, there are hundreds of thousands of heralds um, who actually want to take action, with, regardless of their political stripes, frankly, regardless if they're managing for timber or if they're managing for um, habitat or air or whatever they're managing to, there is a whole host of family landowners that want to take action. And I think we're, we're seeing more and more momentum um, from that. I mean, 500,000 acres in the pipeline um, is, is a lot of acres. If you think about the fact that their, you know, average acreage is about 80 acres. Um, so that's a lot of people. Um, and, you know, there's, there's huge potential here. I think it's, you know, and we're starting to see the political will and the collaboration start to happen because again, the common theme here, we can't take action alone. That's one of the biggest barriers. We need to have strategic priorities that we share and that we focus on together. Um, and, but, but our, I think the hope that we see is, you know, there's, there's family landowners that are, that are, that are ready and primed regardless of where they come from and their political stripes and, and they're ready to take action. <clears throat> Thank you. And thanks so much to all of you. I know we've already gone a little bit over, so I'm going to turn it back over to Lynn at this point. Um, a huge thanks to you guys for uh, joining us and for everyone who's attending. Lynn, over to you. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thanks to that really terrific panel. Uh, I think we could have listened for another hour to the insights and also some of the hope that was embedded in the comments. You know, we, we often hear that the challenges of addressing the wildland fire um, issues require more resources, more resources. And that is true. And we heard that from panelists, but we've also heard a couple of other important themes. One, that the action has to be durable, sustained and holistic. Landscape in scale, all landowners and managers, and also, that predicate of good planning and capacity building, that all of those have to come together to get the sorts of durable and sustained solutions that we need. Now we are going to move with that landscape scale focus to the next panel, uh, looking at wildfire resilience at a landscape scale. And the panelists include Jayla Paul Rivera, who is Associate Deputy Chief of State and Private Forestry at the Forest Service, uh, Saad Daleti, and I apologize if I have not pronounced that correctly, Director of Federal Affairs with Allstate, Lyle Laverty, former Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and our moderator is Cassandra Mosley. Cassandra is Interim Vice President of Research and Innovation at the University of Oregon. She directs the Office of Research and Innovation and serves as the, as the university's Chief <clears throat> Research Officer. She joined the university in 2001, has a distinguished career as a scientific and uh, academic professional. She's a research professor in the Institute for Sustainable Environment and has a particular focus on how natural resource policies affect rural communities, businesses, and workers, a topic very interconnected to the fire issues we're discussing. She studies the changing face of wildfire management in the West. So 
Uh, over to you, Cassandra, to do a deeper introduction of the panelists and then go into our discussion. Great, thank you so much. This has been really uh, interesting so far today and I'm looking forward to our next panel, which is focused on uh, landscape scale, wildfire resilience management. And I'm gonna be sort of brief on the, the bios because I think uh, our panelists have a lot of interesting things to say and we wanna make sure we save some time for Q&A at the, at the end. So I'm gonna dive right in and introduce uh, Jaleth Hall Rivera, which uh, Lynn uh, already said is that she is the um, Deputy uh, Chief of uh, State and Private Forestry at the US Forest Service. In this role, uh, Jaleth uh, provides executive oversight to the agency's wildland fire program and the programs that serve state and private landowners, uh, the Office of Tribal Relations, um, the Forest Health Program, the Conservation Education, and the Gray Towers National Historic Monument, a very small and focused portfolio. So Jaleth, if you could spend a couple of minutes, focus uh, two or three minutes on our questions around landscape scale, uh, wildfire resilience management, that would be great. And then we'll walk through the, our, the rest of our panel. Okay, great. Thank you, Cass. I uh, really appreciate being a part of this panel today and really appreciate TNC and the Aspen Institute, you know, for putting this together. And, you know, uh, I'll just say as partners in the wildland fire system, we're all anchored to the cohesive strategy and to the goals of the cohesive strategy, safe and effective response, resilient landscapes and fire adapted communities. That's been an anchor for all of us for years. But, you know, I think we can also acknowledge that um, we haven't evenly invested in all parts or all of those goals, right, uh, as, a, as a nation. Uh, we, we've over invested or invested uh, very heavily in the response uh, leg of the stool, and we have never fully realized the investments needed in the other two legs of the stool around resilient landscapes and uh, fire adapted communities. And with these opportunities that are coming to us in the infrastructure bill and, and reconciliation and other potential opportunities, we might be finally at a place where we can turn that tide and we can as um, a community begin really truly investing in these other parts of the stool. And in particular for me, to, I would wanna focus on that landscape resiliency that fuels uh, treatments. Um, you know, we know we need to do more. We know we need to be at a bigger scale at a scale of the problem that we're seeing with these massive fires. And uh, we've gotta be doing that work in the right places. You know, the, the three to 4 million acres a year of fuels treatments we all do together are great. We know that they help uh, moderate fire behavior. We know they give uh, firefighters a safe place to work. We know they, they help protect communities, um, but we also know that it's not enough, right? And um, so what we're proposing, at least in the, in the forest service is to significantly scale up that work. What our science is telling us is we need to do about 20 million acres more of treatment in the next 10 years on national forest system lands, maybe up to 30 million acres across all of the rest of our forested landscapes to really make a difference, in particular in the West, which is where you know the bulk of this wildland fire crisis is occurring. Uh, in the Forest Service, we're looking at a tool uh, planning uh, container we call fire sheds. I know many of you are familiar with that. Uh, it's kind of similar to a watershed, it's about 250,000 acres in size. And, and our new planning tools, including scenario investment planning, give us the opportunity to identify those highest uh, profile places to go where the exposures to structure and infrastructure is the highest. And um, that's kind of a starting framework from our perspective about where we need to go uh, when this funding becomes a reality. And we know there are gonna be other things that come in the mix, other factors, other values, in particular, looking at things like traditional ecological knowledge about uh, making sure that we're in service to underserved communities and that we're looking at all those ecosystem benefits that come from our forests. Um, but we've got to, to really focus and do this work in the right places together you know, as a community of partners. So at the Forest Service, we're starting to get ourselves geared up for doing that. And I think many of you probably know that the chief has named Brian Farabee as a senior executive, heading a team that we call the Wildfire Risk Reduction Infrastructure Team. It's kind of gonna be the hub uh, of how we get ourselves organized to do uh, this massive amount of work that, that is going to be coming to us with, with these new funding opportunities. So, you know, uh, I know I have limited time, so I'll just close by saying, like a lot of you, I've been doing this work for a long time, you know, and I have never seen this level of focus and attention 
uh, on investments that we need in our forested landscapes to truly make a difference. And we are on the precipice, right, of um, a historical change. The, the biggest thing to happen in our lives, in our world, maybe since the National Fire Plan. And so it's really, really exciting. And I'm really gratified to, to be able to be a part of that with all of you. Um, we know there's going to be challenges, right? And I and I know that TNC and the Aspen Institute have opened, you know, this dialogue to help us surface some of those capacity challenges, probably being the most acute. And Cash, you're you're well familiar with those. Uh, we need more people to do this work in the woods. We need more people who have prescribed fire credentials. We need markets for all of this timber. And um, you know, we we need a culture shift. At least I can say that in the Forest Service, in terms of how we think about funding and where we put funding. You know, um, it's not a little bit for everybody. It's focusing uh, the bulk of it in those right places. And, and that's a benefit to everyone, right? It's not about winners and losers. It's about everybody winning by making these right investments that are going to have these outcomes that we can really see in terms of changing the trajectory of wildfire. So um, some challenges, but a lot, a lot of opportunities. And I'm really excited to be in that with all of you. And I know that uh, we're up for that challenge. So I'll close my remarks and pass back to you, Cass. Great. Thank you, Jayla. That was really fabulous. So let me turn now to Sahat Alati, who, I uh, apologize if I mispronounced your name, um, is the Director of Federal Affairs and Public Policy at Allstate, the nation's largest publicly held personal lines insurer. And he heads the company's Washington office. He leads all states' policy advoca advocacy efforts with Congress, the White House, and federal agencies, in addition to its public policy work, uh, develop, public policy development at the federal, state, and local level. Over to you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Professor. Uh, I would usually say good afternoon, but I'll say good morning to be uh, inclusive of our West Coaster. Uh, appreciate you having me. And both you and Lynn were, were great on the pronunciation. It's uh, Sadaletti. So you were, you were right there. Appreciate being here with the Aspen Institute. Allstate has been a longtime partner uh, of the Aspen Institute's work. So we obviously think very highly of them. Uh, but I will tell you, I'm not far removed from my time as a staffer on Capitol Hill for Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina and uh, did great work with TNC. Uh, they were often my first call when it came to a variety of conservation issues, um, especially on floods, hurricanes, uh, wetlands, and so on. So uh, to see both of these um, fantastic brands and institutions uh, combine to uh, address this problem, um, it certainly uh, uh, gives me a little bit of optimism. Uh, as, you know, as I had my team pull together the stats and figures and statistics uh, for prep for this discussion, you know, I could go through and give you the numbers of acres, the, you know, the amount of fires, how we've had, you know, four out of the five worst fires in recorded history in just the last five years, but uh, I, I felt like I'd be preaching to the choir a little bit. So I really just wanted to hit on two numbers um, in my intro here. And the first is it's specific to Allstate. And I had to make sure it was a type, it was not a typo um, when I was actually given this number. But here's the statistic that just shocked me. Uh, from the first half of the past decade, so 2011 to 2015, uh, in comparison to the second half of the decade, 2016 uh, through 2021, Wildfire losses at Allstate have increased by 1,665%. Uh, so as you can imagine, I uh, went back to my team. I said, you missed a decibel somewhere. You know, you meant 160%. Uh, you surely can't be telling me that losses have increased uh, from this five-year period to the last by 16 times. Um, and uh, no, that is, that is the case uh, specifically with Allstate. I would wager that other carriers are seeing similar, uh, similar numbers. So if you think about um, folks who might not think we're at a crisis level uh, or that we're not on a sustainable path, uh, you know, for taxpayers, residents, uh, those who are trying to uh, cover these damages financially, uh, we are there. And I think we've been there for some time. Uh, the other figure I did just want to hit on and, and make sure to mention is $47.2 billion. Uh, and that is the investment in disaster resiliency funding called for by the bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, that is currently in front of Congress. Uh, includes uh, money specifically for wildfire mitigation, um, you know, thinning, um, controlled burns. I mean, so many, so many of the different tools that uh, this panel and the past panel have discussed. So, uh, I think uh, w one of the past panelists was discussing political will. Uh, certainly, we at Allstate are uh, enthusiastic supporters of that bill and hopes uh, Congress sends it to the president's desk 
uh, we think there's a solution uh, right there, right there in front of Congress. So, uh, but other than that, happy to be here. So, uh, you know, we at Allstate were certainly not the forest management uh, experts in comparison uh, to the other panelists I, I, I have the honor of speaking with today, but we are certainly well versed in the financial and human toll um, that these wildfires have had on our communities. So uh, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. Um, and let me turn it over now to the Honorable uh, Lyle Laverty, who is a former uh, Assistant Secretary to the Interior, a Senate confirmed position when he worked under uh, President George W. Bush in, in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. Um, he oversaw at that time the National Park Service, the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And prior to serving as director, prior to that, he served as the director of Colorado State Parks and as associate deputy chief in the U.S. Forest Service, which is possibly when I first met him. That's a long time ago. We've been at this a really long time, as Jay Lith pointed out. Okay, over to you, Lyle. Good to see you. And I'm glad you worked out your technology. Uh, thanks, Cass. And, and Lynn, it's so good to see you as well. It's uh, it just it really is a great honor just to be able to be part of this conversation. And it's, uh, it's such a timely uh, subject. And I'll, I'll share kind of my perspectives with uh, some of the historical piece, at least my connection with when we started the uh, first cohesive strategy almost uh, 20, 20 years ago, when we, we put that together and we identified at that time that there were about uh, 30 million acres at high risk. And uh, today that number has jumped up to uh, probably close to 90 million acres that we have across the country that's at, at high risk of, of wildfire damage. And I'll, I'll share with you some perspectives from Colorado. I've been working with some landowners, uh, on some restoration recovery from, from one of our fires last summer. We, we, we had three fires in Colorado that uh, exceeded 200,000 acres. That's the first time in recorded history that we've had fires of that magnitude here in Colorado. Uh, the, the Cameron Peak Fire, it, it started in August and it burned until it was contained in December. Burned 208,000 acres. And there was one period of, of burning from September 4th to September 7th. I think those are the dates. It burned 78,000 acres in that that uh, 72 hour burning period. So I wanna take you on the math to understand the urgency of why this uh, conversation is so important. That, that burned about a thousand acres an hour. So if you continue to drill down on what that means, that's probably burning one football field every four and a half seconds. So if you, if you can just begin to imagine the intensity of what we were uh, putting firefighters, why, why it, it causes such grief. Yeah, and so the, you know, the forest health issue becomes such a critical part of this conversation. And I think as we look at, you know, my, my, my mantra has been healthy forests or healthy communities. And healthy communities, we have healthy watersheds. So all these pieces come together on, on the urgency in jail. I think uh, just, it really articulated well that uh, the urgency that, that we've got to take on. We, we, we put together some, some information uh, several years ago with the uh, Colorado legislature talking about the, the forest health situation we have here in Colorado. And at that period of time, let me get my numbers here so I can share this with you. Our, our net, our growth uh, yield on our forests in Colorado was 119 million cubic feet. The mortality was 260 million cubic feet. So the, the net, net result is that we were in deficit on forest growth in Colorado by almost 130, 140 million cubic feet. So it, it's, um, it, it's a real challenge when you begin looking at the forest health conditions that we have not only here in Colorado, but, but across the whole interior West. So the, the idea of how do we increase pace and scale becomes I think really the fundamental elements of, of the conversation. And I'm really looking forward to, to having the opportunity to explore ideas. And I, I think, you know, certainly with the agent, with the Forest Service, the, the fact that we've been spending so much of our 
investment on suppression costs that we've not been able to be in the position to, to do some of the work that needs to be done to create some of these resiliencies. Cameron Peak Fire, suppression costs were in the neighborhood of $130 million. And the kind of loss of structures were probably in the neighborhood of $130 million as well. And that doesn't do anything to count the watershed impacts that we've had you know, across that uh, 208,000 acres. So that, that was just one fire. And then East Troublesome uh, he did exactly the same kind of thing. You know, had to evacuate the whole town of Estes Park. It has 20,000 people. So, you know, it's a, it's a huge impact. So uh, th this is such a timely, timely subject. And I, I'm, uh, I'm really delighted, Lynn, that uh, the Nature Conservancy is linking with the Aspen Institute to begin exploring, you know, how do we make the breakthrough to make this significant change? So, Cass, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. That, that was a really informative opening uh, set of remarks from every, everyone. And so let me turn to some questions. And I have a really long list, um, but uh, we I, so we will not get through all of them. But uh, because, you know, that's what professors do is ask, ask questions. Um, so, Jay, let me start with you. Uh, you know, you talked in in uh, in your remarks around the importance of organizing capacity and being science driven. Um, but we also, particularly we heard in the panel uh, before, before you got on about the importance of multiple landowners and lots of collaboration. And so I just wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about how the agency is thinking about um, the, 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 the sort of next phase of, of collaboration um, that, you know, you work with state and, and local governments through the, uh, you know, the shared stewardship. There's a long, and then there's a very long history of local collaborations. And so I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about how you're thinking about that piece of the puzzle as, as, as we enter this next phase. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks for that question, Cass. And, um, you know, I think it's absolutely imperative that, that we just name that um, we are gonna be building on that history of collaboration, right? We have, shared stewardship, we have collaboratives, we have CFLRP, we have joint chiefs, we have 20 years of experiments and, and experiences in, in this world that we're gonna be building on in terms of delivering where we need to go in the next decade, right? With it, assuming that we get this substantial increase in funding. And, and it's, you know, I kind of view it as a little bit of a balancing act. Uh, we need to have a framework, we need to be based in science, um, we need to kind of have a plan, you know, to, to engender confidence that as an agency that's going to be receiving all of this money, um, we have a notion of what the next steps are, but we're not doing that in isolation at all. Uh, it's all about co-development, co-prioritizing, and we have the building blocks of that already out there, you know, in particular with our shared stewardship agreements. And, um, you know, we know that uh, all partners are going to come to the table uh, with other tools, other science, other thinking that we need to incorporate, you know, into this kind of framework that, that I shared with you. Um, and, you know, part of that is we're going to be engaging in uh, a public engagement strategy. We're kind of naming the steps of that right now. We've already been talking with lots of different groups uh, like this and others. And so it's not a one size fits all. It's not, you know, we're not coming into this with a fully formed plan. It's kind of like we have, si we have science, we have tools, and we have a framework. And how can we come together? And, um, and, you know, and the reality is, too, I think it's important to say there's going to be a lot of expectations on all of us that we move out pretty quickly once we get this money, right? And so we got to have a short-term strategy. What are we going to do in, say, like the first 30 days, the first uh, 90 days, the first year. And that's probably going to be pretty dependent on projects that are already in the hopper that are pretty much already collaboratively designed. And then what are we going to do in the out years together too? So that's another important, um, you know, way that we're going to be incorporating collaboration. Great. Thank you. And so I, you um, mentioned at the, in, in your remarks that you're no forest expert. Um, and I think what I would say about many of us on this panel is that we're no industry, insurance experts. And one of the things I think that is happening in really interesting ways with the insurance industry and frankly, also in the utilities industry is that those of us who've been you know, sort of sweating wildfire for two decades are, are, are needing to learn a lot more about these other sectors. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, 
you know, we're and, and seeing us as insurance as a really increasingly important partner. And so I would wondering if you could debunk a couple of myths for us. Um, you know, what, what are things that we should know about your industry in order to partner with you better? And, and really, um, you know, where should every, all these partners that JLS just referred to, federal, state, local partners, what do we need to understand about you to advance uh, resilience solutions in partnership with the insurance industry? Sure, happy to address that. And unlike with my college professors, I will not uh, duck your question. I suppose, uh, you know, the, the myth being that insurers are, are bad or bad actors in the system. I mean, I think you put it best, right? We want to be partners with policyholders, residents, communities. Uh, if there's no one around to insure, that's that's not great for insurers, right? I mean, we, we, we need that and want to be there for these communities. You know, I think number one, and, and I got to pick on California in particular, obviously the West is is the biggest problem when it comes to this. And, you know, specifically California plays an outsized role in, in what we've been seeing in wildfires and financial and human damage. The regulatory environment is important. And I think California needs to make a lot of changes there. Uh, you got to credit the commissioner uh, in the state. He's, he's readily admitted that. The legislature got uh, close this time around, but when it comes to being able to use uh, models that take into account climate change, that's something that we have an issue with in California. When it comes to pricing in the purchase of reinsurance uh, into our rate setting, that is something that we cannot do in California. Or even when it comes to um, being able to set prices at an actuarially sound uh, level. And ultimately for a competitive and thriving insurance market to be present, um, price has to be coupled with risk. And I think there have been you know, some elements in this debate that have suggested we move the other direction. But I think ultimately that's going to be important to having um, insurers uh, stand as a partner. The other thing I'll mention, uh, Professor, in, to, to answer your question, you know, the Wall Street Journal uh, did a piece just earlier this year on, I'm sorry, earlier this week on the 22nd on rising cost of homeowners insurance around uh, around the country. And obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, there's, there's multiple factors that are going into that. Price of labor, supply shortage um, issues, you know, no one, no one is immune to that right now. Um, but you know, the piece referenced the growing wildfires and financial damage from uh, natural disasters. Well, the, the article covered a, a, a couple whose uh, premiums had annually gone up to $5,000 and they lived in Florida. They underwent mitigation um, spending. They raised their utilities. I mean, they ended up spending, uh, I think the article quotes at about $3,000 uh, for those mitigation measures which then dropped their annual premium $3,000. So the couple is quoted as literally this, these mitigation efforts paid for themselves in one year um, for those homeowners. So, you know, when you're talking about partnering with local, state, federal government, mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. Um, obviously wildfire is different than hurricanes and floods, but uh, I think some of the same principles that that article outlined uh, can be at play in the insurance uh, industry, just like we are with the uh, wildfire partners in Colorado. Uh, I think we wanna be active partners in those programs. Great, thank you. Um, so let me turn to Lyle. You talked a lot about your work specifically in Colorado, but I wanna uh, take you back to the fact that you've been the leader of many state and federal organizations and been in the room either when very difficult decisions around fire suppression have needed to be made or have made them yourself. So, you know, building on that experience and what we're kind of facing now, how do you think about the, uh, how we go forward to, to manage uh, wildfire for resource benefits, you know, under the right conditions? Um, you know, is, the, is that a tool in the toolbox? How do we, if you think it's, it's the, uh, the right tool, um, you know, how do we make it a tool more often um, as we go forward in this sort of increasingly complicated and, and perilous fire environment? <laughs> Great question. I saved Peter. you the hard. I, I I gave the other one two softballs, and I figured I'd give you the hard one. Uh, oh gosh, I, you know it, it really is a it, it's a wicked issue, and um, the challenge that we have, you know, certainly across the interior west, is we have such unnatural fuel conditions that finding that right right condition when you can in fact put that. Um, that fire on the landscape to, to do what needs to be done. And you know, I, I'm a real advocate that we've got to be able to do some, some proactive work before we can start putting some of that fire on the landscape. Um, you know, we, we've, we've seen example after example 
where we we have fire on the landscape and all of a sudden it gets away from us and we have these catastrophic disasters and we, we just can't do that anymore so you know i i'm a i'm a real advocate that we need to be making some investments on the landscape right now so that we can in fact put fire back on the landscape we know the fire can do a good job for us and we've seen example after example where that where that does work but it has to be under those right conditions and when you when you look at what, what we've experienced just here in denver this last summer we were in smoke probably I want to say 100 days or maybe more than that, uh, you know, smoke from the West and, you know, there's big public health issues. So all those things have to factor into that that equation. So uh, that's a great question. And it, it's one that we need lots of time to have a conversation about. Yep, for absolutely for sure. So thank you for taking a swing at that. And I've been given an extra couple of minutes of reprieve here. So I'm going to ask Jaleth one last question and then we'll wrap up, which is, a similar question, actually. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. I know the Forest Service has been increasingly focused on how to increase prescribed fire as a tool in the toolkit. And could you talk a little bit about the, the work that you've been doing to make it easier to get uh, good fire on the ground in a, in a prescribed fire environment? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks for, for that question. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing that we've been doing um, is working together with our partners at EPA and CDC to really um, help kind of break through some of those challenges that have, have been there over the years about um, this using this tool. And, um, you know, getting um, the regulators, the air regulators, folks that deal with public health, uh, us, Interior, kind of on the same page. And um, so we have, you know, um, we just put out a whole bunch of materials, communications materials, we've been kind of engaged in a little bit of a campaign. We have air resource advisors, which are people that come out to fires and advise, you know, about smoke and managing smoke both for, for wildland fires, but they do it in prescribed fires too. And we have, we train people from CDC and EPA to be in those roles. And so that's been a really critical breakthrough, I think, is to, to get that kind of all of government support for expanding this tool. Uh, you know, other work that we've been doing is just to try to provide that backing and support to our line officers and to our fire managers who are making these difficult choices, you know, um, trying to provide the right environment, uh, even if we're in, um, say, a pretty challenging fire season, but some places have the right windows, let's, you know, we try to really provide that leadership backing and support for people to use that tool. And, um, and also just kind of getting the word out there you know, about needing to have more fire, um, kind of like Lyle said. And I just, I know this wasn't a question that you asked me, but, you know, um, fire as a tool, prescribed fire is really, really critical, but we have to use a managed fire as well. And, it, you know, it's got to be in the right place. It's got to be in the right time. And I couldn't agree with Lyle more. We've got to get our landscapes in a place where they can, you know, be ready for it first. But, you know, I also just want to acknowledge that it, it's um, it's controversial and it, it it creates a lot of concern for people and generates a lot of heartburn and even some anger, you know, uh, that that when the federal agencies use this tool or people have a perception that we're not being uh, aggressive, that we're letting fires burn, that we're purposely putting communities at risk. And, you know, I just think it's important that we be upfront about that because that's that is in our system. And um, I know the chief is really, really committed to continuing to have a dialogue about this, have it be science based. You know, and so we're going to be looking for, for venues to do that because we got to bring our communities and they're the ones who are being affected. They're the ones that are breathing that smoke. Um, so I just wanted to put that, you know, out in the room for folks too. that. And we're going to be trying to explore how can, we can kind of increase the uh, discourse around fire as a management tool, you know, prescribed fire and managed fire. Great. Thank you, Jaleth. And I just want to thank all of our panelists. This was really an informative session. And uh, let me hand it back over to Lynn to keep the, the event moving. Yeah, thank you so much, Cass. And thank you to all the panelists. Uh, really terrific discussion. Uh, I can't get over that, that figure of a thousand percent increase in the insurance costs associated with these fires. That's just uh, ringing in my head as an astronomical number. Uh, and therefore highlighting how critical it is to drive solutions for this, this uh, set of challenges. But as we close, 
Um, we have some recorded reflections from Colorado Senator Michael Benefit, Bennett. He has represented Colorado in the US Senate since 2009. He's recognized as a pragmatic and independent thinker. He's driven by an obligation to create more opportunity for the next generation. Senator Bennett has built a reputation of working with Republicans and Democrats to address our nation's greatest challenges, including education, climate change, immigration, health care, national security, and of course, fire. Before serving in the Senate, Senator Bennett worked to restructure failing businesses and help create the world's largest movie theater chain. As superintendent of the Denver Public Schools, he led one of the most extensive reform efforts in the country, resulting in substantial academic improvement for Denver's children. So we're gonna watch a little video and then I'll come back and wrap up with a few closing comments. Hi everybody, it's Michael Bennett, and I'm grateful for the chance to share a few words with you today, but most important, I'm grateful for the group you've gathered to identify and advance solutions to the challenge of wildfires in the West. As all of you know, three of the largest wildfires in Colorado's history all happened last year, and even though we were lucky in Colorado this year, fires from other states have blanketed the country and my state in smoke. Wildfires come at a terrible cost to state and local governments, our health and well-being, and communities across the Mountain West. They affect every part of our economy, small businesses and water utilities, outdoor recreation, and farmers and ranchers. And for decades, Washington's approach has been penny-wise and pound-foolish. After a century of fire suppression and decades with a cash-strapped forest service, we ought to invest in our forests and grasslands to build resilience and reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfires and protect our water. Instead, Western wildfires have cost our country $67 billion in the last five years alone. There's nothing fiscally responsible about that approach. And thanks to many of you participating today, that message has finally made it through Congress. The USDA now tells us that the most important thing Congress can do is boost resources for forest restoration and management across all lands. And that's why as we started to work on an infrastructure package earlier this year, I introduced a bill to invest tens of billions of dollars to restore our forests, protect our watersheds, and build resilience in partnership with states, tribes, utilities, and landowners. I've told Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer that our forests and watersheds are as important to our economy in the West as the Lincoln Tunnel is to New York, maybe more so. And I'm hopeful that over the next few weeks, we'll get this once in a generation investment over the finish line. After that, our work won't stop. We'll still need to figure out how to build local capacity, grow the forest workforce, and find markets for low value wood. I've worked on many of these topics over the last decade as a member of the Senate Agriculture Committee and chair of the Forestry Conservation and Climate Subcommittee. There, we've written two bipartisan farm bills that created new tools like Good Neighbor Authority and the Water Source Protection Program and reauthorized CFLRP. And we have another opportunity ahead with the 2023 Farm Bill just around the corner. And that's why I'm so grateful for the conversation you're having today and in the months to come. I look forward to following your conversations, hearing your recommendations, and carrying them forward here in Washington. The work you are doing is vital for our economy, our health, and our well-being in the West. We have a moral responsibility to leave more resilient forests, cleaner air, better water, and a stronger economy for our kids and grandkids. And I'm confident that by working together, we can make progress toward that end. So thank you. A big thank you to Senator Bennett for his leadership on this issue and so many others and his focus on problem solving and trying to bring problem solving to the fire arena. Senator Bennett's comments captured the essence of the challenge, why it is so critical to all of America, our health, communities, economies, forests and grasslands, conservation and climate. Indeed, he suggests it is even 
a moral imperative. It's encouraging to me to see the heightened focus of the nation, the Congress, tribes, states, local governments, and the private sector on what is needed to address the challenges of extreme fires. As all participants today illustrated, the challenge before us requires everyone being engaged and working together. Yes, some solutions reside in more funding to invest in forest and grassland health, but some of the solutions also reside in ensuring we have fire safe communities, innovations in our forest economies and much more. And indeed in the last panel, we were reminded that engagement of, of communities requires education and an understanding of why we have prescribed burning and managed fires. It's encouraging to see the extent of shared themes that comprise solutions and the embrace of collaboration, working across silos, engaging with the public and private sectors. During my years at the Department of the Interior, already we had begun to see the changes underway toward more extreme fires. And we'd begun to see the shift from what had been called a fire season to challenges almost throughout the calendar. We had seen the urging for comprehensive planning and interagency coordination, the essential need for increased fuels reduction to enhance the resilience and health of forests. Many themes we heard today had their seeds some years ago. I recall those themes. I recall discussions centered on those themes, but I'm struck by the greater sense of urgency and commitment. I'm struck by the significance of actions underway to translate commitments and thoughts to action. Yet still, there's much more to do as all of our speakers have attested. And I wanna go back to the focus that David Hayes brought to the issue of climate change. It looms large, both as a multiplier of the challenges, the climate nexus lies both in the effects of climate on changing conditions that increase the prospects of extreme fires that amplify the and amplify the importance of the resilience that we've talked a lot about today. But climate nexus also lies in the role of nature, including forests, and the role that forests and, the, and other aspects of nature play in sequestering carbon and contributing to climate mitigation. As our forests burn in some of these catastrophic wildland fires, we are releasing greenhouse gases, but also destroying those very forests that are part of the climate solution. So our Nature Conservancy Aspen partnership in the upcoming months will be convening discussions about all these solutions, holding a summit next year and providing a comprehensive roadmap to enhancing the health of forests and grasslands and reducing risks of extreme fires that have continued to devastate so many communities. This challenge is personal for me. Uh, the last fire that came down a canyon where I live in Santa Barbara came within one quarter mile of my home. So I know the real risks to communities and what it has meant to people around me in my own neighborhood. So we look forward to working with all of you on these solutions as we work together in this partnership with the Aspen Institute and I hope with all of you so that we have comprehensive solutions, put the funding towards those solutions, the capacity building that so many people uh, described, the education so that we're on the same page of what needs to be done. So thank you very much for your time and just Terrific panelists and keynote speakers. Really appreciate uh, your time and attention. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. It was 